All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you. I'm alive. It's a good day. It's an exciting day. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Dr. Sharbram Plummer, and I am here as part of East Baton Rouge Parish Library's One Book, One Community program, responding to Sarah M. Broom's The Yellow House. I'm super excited. Um, and hi to everyone who's tuning in virtually, who I can't see. Um, today's presentation is called From Homemaker to Culture Shaper, um, Black Women's Creative Journey. So a little overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, of course, black women, fiber artists, art education and history, which is sort of my research area, um, material culture, and then haptic memory, which is actually the name of my dissertation, um, where I'm talking a little bit about family heritage and art making. Um, so a little bit of background, and I don't even know if my mom and my grandmother know this, they're in the audience, um, but my entire dissertation project was sort of birthed from what came um, after my great-grandmother passed. So that's the younger picture of her um, there. Her name was Rebecca. And so um, I remember hearing all these stories about her, and I talked to my grandmother a lot about my great-great-grandmother as well. Um, her name was also Rebecca. But you know, after someone passes, especially the matriarch of the family, people sort of inherit things, right? Um, homes change and shift and their energy is sort of there but they aren't present anymore and there's all this weird stuff that comes up so often you have to rely on oral histories um, other memories and I started thinking about the things that we also inherit that aren't material we inherit that aren't material but are still very significant so for instance the women in my family uh, we don't really take much stuff off of anyone and I have that same tenacity about myself <laughs> but from that time my synapses started to kind of fire off because I really started thinking about how that might shape art and creativity right all of this all of the stuff that we inherit and we observe and the beauty we see around us in our homes um, so for example I'm the I'm the first person in my family to really study art or kind of dive into it as a career option but I come from generations of creative people um, my mom and my grandma are probably two of the most creative people I know and sort of beauty and aesthetics were always a part of my life. My grandma wasn't in the garden or doing something. My mom was putting way too many pillows on the bed and like making everything super fluffy and fancy. Um, so that sort of self-investigation led me to talk to other people, mostly black women at that time, about their own lives. And a lot of them were artists too. And so after enough conversations, I said, you know what, there's, there's something here that I want to explore. Um, there are women that history books may never speak of because they didn't necessarily identify themselves as artists, right? Um, or because they didn't create work or do things that were deemed significant um, according to a Western standard or a European standard. And they were who I wanted to write about and that's what I wanted to explore. Um, so in addition to amplifying the work of black women artists, um, I wanted to see who are the women that we might hold in high regard um, who help us to shape the works we come to know and love in art museums and things like that. They're sort of hidden behind history. So when you're doing your doctoral research, they're gonna ask you, you know, what's, what's the problem? What's the thing you're trying to solve? And for me, it was the fact that black women's presence and voices um, have been erased from history, whether it's art history, world history, US history, um, and that's a significant problem. So I won't read my big long spiel here, but um, it essentially talks about how fiber and textiles, so everything from clothes to quilts to weaving, all these other things, um, when you think about them in art, you think about fine art, they already aren't considered like high or fine art. It's outsider art, it's craft. Um, there are all these labels that are attached to it um, that sort of place it at a lower um, level within art. And then on top of that, based on who's producing it, so for example, black women um, who are also marginalized in society, when you put those two things together, that places the work at even a lower level. Um, point of esteem sort of on the spectrum. And so I wanted to explore and sort of undo some of that work. And so from there, um, I had to dive into material culture. So material culture can be defined as the human formed objects, spaces, and expressions that make up our world and are frequently the articles that we construct and or possess for the purpose of personal memory making and the shaping of individual or group identity. So in other words, what are the things, what's the stuff in our life, right? What are the objects that speak to us um, and can offer a glimpse into the things that we write about throughout history 
or the ones that have been written for us. And so I wanted to explore how different social conditions and movements and rituals and practices can be framed through an object's life story. So I just thought about this looking down. Um, I have my mask here, whereas before, you know, we might have seen this as something that you only use in certain occasions, like masks are now a part of material culture because we've lived through a pandemic. And it's this thing that now we've ascribed a different meaning to because we all have to wear them and um, utilize them for personal safety. Um, so material culture um, is sort of the study of goods and objects and the built environment and all these different things, right? But I was curious about where black women's lived experience and material contributions existed on that spectrum. And so to kind of go backwards a little bit, oftentimes when people, I talk about fiber art and quilts and stuff like that, they talk about it as women's work. But if you think about, you know, okay, it's domestic work, these sorts of things, um, based on your lived experience or based on who you are, that's gonna have different meanings for you. So for me, my experience as a black woman may not have been the same as that of a white woman or someone of a different race, et cetera. So I wanted to sort of really dig deep into the meat of what those nuances are. And forgive me if you hear rustling, I'm moving through my notes. Um, so I think about how in the Yellow House, um, Sarah actually writes about Lolo, who was her grandmother, and the exchange of knowledge that came through material culture. So she says that, Sarah meaning, says that Lolo learned from Sarah McCutcheon how to find the numius in the everyday. It was from her that her grandmother um, learned how to dress the body and dress the house like you would dress a body, or how she discusses her mom and aunt's enjoyment in creating their own wardrobes describing sewing as sort of making a self. So material culture is the thing that helps us to explore those realities. Um, I won't cover every detail today, but in summary, I spent some time working through what I've referred to as a black feminist material culture, meaning that we can study and interpret the materiality of black womanhood as defined by us. Oops, I'm sorry, excuse me. As defined by us. Um, so. To me, it demonstrates the means by which black women have been able to survive and challenge adverse forces. And this sort of approach takes objects, everything from like the iconic, something like an Afro pic to the everyday like a mask, um, and mines them for stories of resistance, agency, imagination, and creativity. And feel free to just, if you have questions um, later about anybody that's pictured, if I haven't touched on them, you can feel free to ask. Um, so in order for me to sort of take this exploration, I had to go way, way back um, and really kind of start around early enslavement, so the time in which we were first brought into this country. Um, so I said, okay, not only does this sort of concept or theory need to draw on the parallels between women's work and material culture, but it also needs to talk about black women's specific relationship to legacies of labor within this country. Um, also, this sort of concept should focus on pleasure-based narratives, things that make us happy, like why we create to bring ourselves joy. Um, and also, it should allow us to sort of write or imagine what our ancestors couldn't, um, knowing that certain parts of our history will never be verified just because how, of how it was fragmented. Um, but because we couldn't map that history in a way that prioritizes the written word, we should actually consider oral histories as like a valid site of knowledge production. That's how we share stories. Um, so starting here kind of with indigo, and cotton, so this is just an image of um, indigo being cultivated um, during enslavement, um, as well as cotton. So before we even get into talking about how we fashion the self or discussing the artifacts that make up material culture, we actually have to think about the primary materials that were um, cultivated or sourced. So we know that during enslavement, um, enslaved Africans and black folks were a workforce that engaged with this material in a way that not only shaped our nation's economy, but also opened up pathways for mass productions of different garments. So the boom of indigo and cotton allowed for uniforms to be um, constructed that contributed to the Civil War, even the clothes that folks wore every day, et cetera, um, and essentially built this nation. Um, so I propose that not only do we need to look at that legacy, but really hone in on black women's work because it was central to the function of plantation life. So this sort of overlap between labor and gender meant that black women had to sort of bear the brunt of the work that came with being racialized, so being black, um, which was already demoralizing, right? But in addition to doing sort of field work, cutting crops, picking cotton, there was also the side where you had to come in and then complete domestic tasks of cooking, cleaning, laundering, child rearing, um, even kids that weren't your own. 
So this produced this sort of site of equal oppression where you're treated with the same level of severity as men, but you're also exploited because of your womanhood. Um, however, it's through our labor that black women were able to understand the ways in which their oppressors were actually dependent on them. So those shifts in that understanding of power um, gave way to a will to fight and sort of created what I called like a household of resistance. So being a caretaker meant you knew everything that was happening on a plantation. You knew all the other things that maybe others didn't see. And based on that knowledge, um, you could create a way for survival for your family, et cetera. So before access to more formal Western traditions became available, fiber was essentially the earliest kind of artistic medium that we had available for manipulation. So black women often constructed clothing um, and used cloth to create things for wear and use by everyone on the plantation, right? And so in the midst of this, folks were able to also define their own personal style um, through mending and maintaining their wardrobes by making use of what was available to them. So in some ways, there you start to map out these sort of early knowings of creativity because it's like, okay, I'm gonna make the best out of what I have and I'm gonna make it work and make it fashionable. Um, so from there, enslaved women, my sort of approach to looking at material culture through a black feminist lens means that enslaved women were able to be seen as skillful and creative individuals um, whose handiwork was a visual imprint and it wasn't just something that, that they created from cast-offs. Um, so the same can be seen in quilting. So here we have Harriet Powers and her Bible quilt and this is one of the most, um, or one of the more well-known quilts that you often find talked about in the art world. And um, when you think about quilting or how quilting is written about, early historians typically excluded all groups um, or individuals who weren't deemed like the quintessential homemaker, which at the time was white women, um, they sort of erased them from early quilt writings and black women often um, had to bear the brunt of that erasure. So mistresses of the antebellum South were write, written in as like these really scripted and, and masterful needle workers and black women were sort of these dutiful aides that helped them on the side. And so from there, um, that sort of created this, this story, right? So everything I'm talking about, keep in the forefront of your mind, like how we shape stories. So that created this story that instead of black women possessing their own creativity, instead um, the mistresses were like imparting this knowledge on them that allowed them to be skilled. Um, and so they were anonymous assistants versus sort of like the birthers of creativity on their own. Um, but black women of the time also maintained their own quilt traditions outside of plantation owners' wives' um, needs and standards. And for them, it was not only an act of labor, but it was also an act of leisure. You could have fun, you could get together in quilting bees and build other rituals around it and do what it is that you wanted to do. Um, another example, we all know who this is, Sojourner Truth. Um, so in keeping with this whole notion of pleasure and enjoyment, right, um, I bring in Sojourner Truth, who was an avid knitter. She knitted a lot, and a lot of folks don't know that. Um, but so often we write about her focuses, um, which are necessary on her abolitionist work and all these other things, but I think it's equally as important to have conversations about how rest and leisure um, and all these other things were just as important to survival as working. Um, so next time you do a Google search and you look up uh, Sojourner Truth, I recommend that you see how many images you see of just her holding her knitting needles and then consider maybe what parts of herself that you hadn't thought about deeply. Um, other examples might include resistance post-emancipation um, and how pleasure and labor and material culture were all wrapped up into one another. So um, the image at the top is of um, washerwomen, not the specific group I'm about to reference, but just as a, an image reference. Um, in Atlanta, sort of two decades or so after slavery was abolished, um, black women worked as laundresses in the U.S. and in Atlanta specifically more than any other type of domestic work. So Atlanta had more black laundresses than they had male common laborers. Um, only a small amount of white women at the time worked for pay and the average white family could afford uh, the services of at least one washerwoman. So laundering was a very, very difficult task. You had to wash everything by hand. They even made their own soap from lye. Sometimes you have things strung out outside in your house all over the place. Um, and at the time, the women were getting really frustrated because they felt like they were being undervalued, they were made to, to do long hours, um, and they weren't being viewed as human, um, and they weren't being considered in that way. Um, so in their minds, they're like, you know, folks are viewing us as former slaves, we're still sort of like relegated to the margins, but we're not invisible, we have a voice, we have a say. So from there, they were able, over the course of, I believe, a month, 
um, grew from 20 people to 3,000 people. They started this group called the Washing Society. Um, and based on there, they started a strike. And the strike even uh, supported other domestic workers. So cooks, other folks who were working in hospitality were like, you know what, we're kind of fed up too. Uh, but from there, that just goes to show you how this sort of notion of power, labor, black women working within material could be used um, to create a platform for resistance. And if we fast forward, um, the 1960s and 70s gave way to the civil rights movement, black power movement, and women's liberation movement. So black women started to get a little more traction and leeway and say, okay, well, we see this as um, an art form, but it was still considered folk art. But at the bottom is an image of um, women from the Freedom Quilting Bee. So in Wilcox County, Alabama, there was a group that bridged creative production and advocacy. So as visitors would travel throughout Wilcox County, um, they would go and see like all of these quilts just hung along on string um, and twine and clotheslines. And we're like, what is happening? What's going on? And they actually gained a lot of interest and traction. And from there, um, they were able to start a cooperative. And at that time, that quilting cooperative came together. Um, and not only were they just, you know, sitting around talking, having a good time, like I know we can all think about like when you're little and you see your grandma and your aunts and everybody sort of having fun. So they did that, but also um, they would organize around issues related to education, better housing, paved roads, getting telephone lines, and they were able to sell their work. Um, they got a contract through Sears and Roebuck. They even sold their work just individually and help to raise funds to um, support the fight against racial injustice during the civil rights movement. So I offer those examples because if we kind of look at the past and then we fast forward to present day, I wanna know like who were those people that informed the women who were creating work that I was studying when I was an undergrad and in grad school. So for instance, Jay Jarrell, um, I wanna know who, who supported her? Who shaped her sort of view of sewing and constructing the body and how she came to come uh, and be a part of the Afrocobra Collective and how she created like works like her uh, urban wall suit, which is the suit on the left that really was responding to the protest of the time of black power and things that were happening in her neighborhood and surroundings. Who were the women in her family who might have shaped that? or Zenobia Bailey, who specifically uh, explores the stories of black homemakers who what she calls, through what she calls her aesthetic of funk. And she even says, through the observation of my mother and oral history of my grandmothers, along with other women in my community, I seek to recreate the incorporation of found objects and recycled materials, excuse me, into the culture of the black home, specifically the way that colors, patterns, textures, et cetera, are blended together. So she directly pays homage to them um, but you know, I wanted to know more about them because these had to be some powerful people to essentially encourage the creation of this sort of work. Or even someone like Amber Robles Gordon who uses fiber to highlight the stories and injustices that history attempts to erase, such as Henrietta Lacks, um, whose cancer cells were harvested without her knowledge or consent at John Hopkins in 1951 and continue to be used in research to this day. So the work you see here is actually an installation related to that. Or even Faith Ringgold. When I first started doing my research, everyone would say, well, are you researching Faith Ringgold? And I was like, well, yes, and um, she's come to be one of the most well-known artists in terms of quilting um, in the modern art world. But she often writes about her mother, whose name was Willie Posey Jones, who was integral to her practice and the development of her quilted work. So there was this woman who we rarely hear about um, who essentially set the foundation for someone like Faith Ringgold to grow and um, become as prominent as she has within the art world. So there are a lot of layers here, um, as you can see. But whenever you're pursuing your PhD, they always ask you to sort of scale these large inquiries down to one core question. And that will eventually sort of inform other sub-questions. So my question was, what kind of artistic language and new knowledge emerges when black women engage in fiber-based art making to explore shared consciousness and kinship? So the sort of summary of that is what happens when black women get together to talk about why they make, who inspired what they make, and what they do and what ultimately drives their creativity. So I wanted to see what came up when I sort of with intention replicated some of those earlier conversations that I was having when I was thinking through like, oh, I was talking to other artists, you know, what, what makes you drawn to fiber, et cetera? And everyone would always say, well, my mom or my grandmother, or I watched my aunt do this and that, and so I wanted to explore what that could look like um, 
with us being in conversation with another verse with one another versus typically um, art is predominantly white what happens when we talk versus other folks coming together from outsider perspectives to get this information if we're able to talk as a community I feel like it could have produced something really rich which it did which I'll share in a second so based on that I sort of crafted a study that utilized narrative research which is storytelling um, and arts-based research art making and it was informed by a black feminist viewpoint so these three lovely people um, are the women that were my interviewees and collaborators. So there was Karen Hampton, uh, the first person. She's actually sitting in front of her great-great-grandmother's quilt, and she's a weaver, um, and she has a sort of multimedia practice. There's Carolyn Crump, who is a quilter, but also a really, really amazing designer. And then there's Lloyd Lang, who does embroidery and needlework. And so from there, I sort of developed three main concepts where after many, many interviews, and I, I can share a little bit later, but I don't have time to go through everything, um, but there were some findings just based on conversations that came up um, where I was able to sort of pull out these concepts that were language that I said, okay, I'm gonna use this to describe the work that black women do within fiber. Um, so the first is that I called it sort of intersectional memory work. So as I was talking to each of these interviewees, we were speaking, and everyone would always go back to, well, I sat in the sewing room with my mom, or I sat in the sewing room with my grandmother, or my mom was a designer, or like, I remember we had to learn how to stitch. Like a fun fact, I didn't know that most young girls within the curriculum in Jamaica, two of my collaborators had Jamaican um, ancestry, they have to take some sort of needlework or embroidery. It's just baked into the curriculum. And from there, um, in addition to that, their grandmothers were either seamstresses or at the time, they might have went to school but then immigrated to the U.S. and couldn't get a job, so they were sort of relegated back to working within domestic roles. And from that observation, that sort of gave them the permission to go and work in fiber and feel like they could own that medium for themselves. Um, so I felt like as black women artists, they were participating in the development of a cultural memory. Um, and from there, working with fiber sort of created these transactions through which they exchanged memories and then revisited them and were sort of building um, this repository for themselves where they were looking at, you know, why their grandmothers had to be seamstresses versus like being the secretaries that they wanted to be or not being able to be entrepreneurs, etc. So there was all of these memories that were sort of overlapping that created um, this driving force that really compelled them to make work that actually paid homage to them. The second was that it's autoethnographic time travel. So I don't know if anyone has heard of autoethnography, but in some ways, it's you sort of telling your story um, based on the intersections of your experiences. And so from there, I felt like there was always this sort of back and forth that was happening. So in a second, you'll see some of Karen's work. And she was always sort of thinking back to one of the things I remember her saying was, you know, I wonder how terrifying it had to be my grandmother coming to Jamaica on a train by herself in New York. She didn't know anyone. She didn't have any family there. Um, what was it like, like this young girl starting life anew? And so each one of them would really always sort of talk through them wondering what their mothers went through, their foremothers, all the women in their family. Um, and then they would also place themselves like, well, if it were me, if I was doing this thing, this is how I would have done it. Or, you know, I don't know that I would have been able to make it. And so there was just always this progression throughout history where they were only not only looking at their familial history, but they were also wanting to sort of fill those voids of history as well, where they're like, I wish I would have been able to learn about X, Y, and Z. Why didn't I? Who was making work at this time? Um, and then the last part is that there was an acceptance and ownership of an aesthetic inheritance. So I have a quote here um, from Bell Hooks, who actually writes about this in an article in uh, one of her books. And she talks about Baba, who was her grandmother, and how she would also observe her quilting. And she says, I remain passionately committed to an aesthetic that focuses on the purpose and function of beauty, of artistry in everyday life, especially, especially the lives of poor people, one that seeks to explore and create the connection and celebrate the connection, sorry, between our capacity to engage in critical resistance and our ability to experience pleasure and beauty. I want to create work that shares with an audience particularly oppressed and marginalized groups, the sense of agency, artistry offers, and empowerment. So Bell Hooks talks about um, all these ways of thinking that were passed down by her mother and her grandmother. Um, and that act was also manifest, manifested by my collaborator several times throughout my study. So I remember Karen um, saying, 
you know, I remember sitting in my grandmother's sewing room and this, there was this place where like the magic happened. And I was like, well, tell me more about that. What do you mean where the magic happened? And she was like, you know, typically in my house, everything had to be clean. Everything had to be tidy. So this was the one place where they would go in and there's like bales of fabric everywhere and this thread and they're trimming and they're cutting. Um, and she was like, and I felt like I wanted that too. I wanted to recreate that magic for myself. And so by the sort of aesthetic inheritance, I meant that there are women in their family who shape their view of beauty, of aesthetics, of art, before art was even you know, thought of as such. All three of them said, like, I don't know that my mom or my grandmother would have considered themselves an artist, but I knew they were making work that was um, creative and that contributed to um, my view of the art world or wanting to shape art for myself. Um, so those are just three concepts I wanted to share with you that came up um, during that study. And then also some of the themes that sort of arose as I was mining through my data. So ancestry, self-determination, and maternal influence were three primary things that came up. And forgive my, um, my little blooper here, but um, first, as I started to dig and sort of think, okay, well, what is coming up for me if, as I'm talking to these women? What are sort of the common threads that I can pull out? The first was that all four of us were working from this feeling of obligation um, to our ancestors and our material of choice, aka fiber, gave us the chance to kind of commune with them and convene with them and really investigate the histories that are embedded within the use of cloth. Um, and for me, I actually should have said this earlier, sort of my, one of my inheritances was my great grandmother's sewing machine and her table and I remember some days I would just kind of like sit with it and look at it and tinker with it um, and kind of think about her life and what she did. And she was also a very petite woman, so she had to tailor a lot of her clothes. So <laughs> I would always think about like, I wonder if this is what she like spent most of her time doing. Um, but we felt this sense of obligation because we had permission to sort of explore and be who we wanted to be. And we weren't bound to having to work in domestic jobs, et cetera. So we wanted to, um, to honor that through art making. And the second was that Self-determination was this core value that was at the heart of all of their lives and viewpoints. So all of them wanted to demand respect for black women and black experiences. And all of them stated that art making and storytelling um, was able to help them strengthen their own autonomy over their voice and narrative and feel like they could really stand up and stand tall as strong black women. And then the lastly, of course, as I've said throughout the presentation was that there was maternal influence. So that sort of creative encouragement and output of their mothers, of our black mothers and maternal figures as caregivers and creatives, um, offered them a look at how black women could have shaped fiber art practices even without them having to go to school to study it. They were able to see and experience that for themselves. Um, and then the part that's kind of um, overlapped here is that there's intergenerational dialogue. So we found that by sitting with our mothers, by sitting with our grandmothers, by sitting with our elders, um, they were able to impart knowledge on us that sort of helped us to become the next generation of storytellers that enhanced this stewardship of cultural memory. So we felt obligated to sort of pass it forward and continue to do the work of telling these stories and capturing them um, if we had children or just to put out into the world in general. So I wanted to share a couple of images. Um, Carolyn Crump is an amazing quilter. She makes a lot of three-dimensional work. So this is her warrior quilt. So everything you see here is fabric. Um, that she constructs and it's just amazing. I wish I could have examples in person, but as you can see, it's super detailed um, and just, just extremely beautiful. And it, my big thing with my project was that while quilting is important, I wanted to show a more robust uh, example of how black women were working with fiber beyond just traditional quilt making. So that's why her work was so appealing to me. Um, this one is called Cherish Time. So you can see the mother here doing her embroidery. There's the puppy. and some um, veggies from her garden and folks in the back doing work and it's just a really nice scene of a simple life um, and oftentimes she'll either put herself or her family members within her work which I thought was very beautiful. Um, you have Spirits Cry by Karen Hampton and a lot of her work also like I said reflects back on this notion of what her ancestors might have gone through or they weren't able to tell their story so how can I, how can I kind of tell that for them um, and she's primarily a weaver and so she often reflects on sort of these spirits and entities that exist within her family um, and tries to call those stories to the forefront. The Matriarchs, I thought, was a very interesting piece. Um, it looks at both the plantation mistress and the washerwoman. So thinking about in plantation life, you had two matriarchs. So while power may have placed white women as the head of the household, you really had black women who were doing 
the brunt of the work to make sure that things could function as needed. So you have these sort of two matriarchs that exist uh, within this larger structure. And then there's Loy, who uses a lot of like tufting and needlework, et cetera. Um, and she oftentimes creates images of black women um, in positions of power or that just amplify them and illuminate them and portray them in a really beautiful light, which I love. And this is another artist, Sheena Rose, um, that she did on fabric as well with uh, embroidery thread. Another fun fact is that I also created work as part of my dissertation. Um, and so for me, I was thinking like, well, you know, I've spent all this time researching, I've spent all this time doing this work, what, what do I do with this information now? Um, and for me, part of that meant like figuring out how I wanted to sort of carry all of these lessons with me. So I literally started creating an embroidered manifesto where I was like thinking of the words that my grandmother might have told me or words that I heard um, when I was researching, things that stood out to me that I wanted to carry um, literally and figuratively and then I imposed that onto the work as well. And so I have that here with me if you want to take a look as well as some books um, that really shaped my research and were just interesting references in that show. Um, just a more robust picture of like what's possible for black women artists in fiber. So to summarize a few of the outcomes, et cetera, um, by engaging in this project, I was sort of able to understand like what fiber meant for me, exploring materiality, how I define material culture for myself. So I felt like I started looking at my upbringing and my life in a completely different light. Um, even down to a funny thing is like, you know, why did all of us as little girls like have to wear those dresses that look like cut up curtains? I have some people in the audience who are nodding. Um, but just every single thing I started to dissect differently, like why our mothers adorned us the way they did, the bows we wore, all these other things and what they signified. Um, for me also, I wanted to explore um, what it would mean to sort of overlap these fiber techniques fiber techniques and create think something for myself um, that allowed me to sort of be an artist and a researcher inspired by other black women. So sort of carrying that same notion forward of like other women inspiring me to create and then I inspire others to create. Um, and then also even my own sort of self-determination um, and self-esteem were enhanced by this. I was able to feel like, yeah, I'm doing a great thing. Like this is a work that, that these are mediums that I can work with to produce things um, that tell a story that I want to see as well. And so um, I think this is my second to last slide. Just in terms of kind of what's coming next or what happened after that, um, I'm continuing this work because I think it's important to show how power dynamics can be shifted through storytelling. So if you have a group of people who you might not be able to go to the library and look them up immediately, or if they aren't written about, storytelling is a really powerful tool for you to get the information that you might need um, to tell a more holistic picture or to actually um, create discourse and, and conversations that paint, uh, sorry, paint people um, in a light that actually accounts for the fullness of their lived experiences. And as well, my dissertation, I'm putting it into a smaller publication because I know that folks might not want to read 400 pages. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not going to make y'all do that. Um, and I'll have a virtual um, option as well. And I'm also continuing interviews because this is something that I think is super important. Um, capturing these stories and then also telling the stories of those women um, who got us here, who were able to bring us here. I think it's important to honor them. And then we also wrote a book chapter, my advisor and I, about um, my research and about this data. And uh, it'll be released, I believe, in summer of this year. But yeah, so that's sort of my research in a nutshell, a little bit of history around black women's sort of creative progressions and the things that we've done. Um, both within art making but just in everyday life. But I will stop for questions and I appreciate you being here and listening. Thank you. It's okay. I'm from Baton Rouge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Born and raised, just moved back last year. It's a uh, it's huge. So my mom, my grandmother's right here in the tan sweater, and my mom is here with the scarf. Um, but it's, it's great. I think that now, especially having had time to leave and like incubate those ideas, I feel like I came back home with a thousand more questions. Like my grandma would tell you, I'm always asking, now, who was this? What did they do? And why is that? And so I think it's made me even more of like um, an, an untrained archivist 
like I want to know all the family history. I want to like piece all these things together. And now that I'm home, it's not me having to pick up the phone and ask. I could just go to her house and look through pictures and make work with that. So I think it's actually informing some um, new visual pieces that I'll start working on. Thanks. Okay, the next question for Dr. Plummer, and I'm gonna ask you to speak it into the mic so we can capture it, because we actually have people watching from home. And I apologize for also running in late. Okay. Um, I was in another room and it was kind of like, oh, dang, <laughs> I didn't set, I turned the phone on silent. So another, I personally want to thank you. Um, I'm old. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost 65, but I was fortunate enough to grow up with three great grandparents wow. who either told lies or stories all the time because as in many intergenerational houses, if the parents are working, the grandparents and the great grandparents are your toys. <laughs> and supposedly your minders, but really they're your toys. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up watching my great grandmother's hands never stop, mm. whether they were needleworking, a lot of mending because we were messy. Um, but uh, the quilts, the bla the curtains in the yellow house, when she talks about almost the first thing that she does is make sure she's got curtains. Mm -hmm. I remember my grandmother and my great grandmother and then my mother, we were always <laughs> making curtains for the new house, stenciling, needle pointing, quilting. And then there was no go to the store and buy things. It was, you want a new Easter dress, you make it. Yep. Uh, and I remember being with the old Singer sewing machine. Is that what you grew up on? And the pedal and, um, <laughs> you know, vroom, vroom, vroom. And um, I remember that. So I'm just so thrilled that you share the fact that let's g capture these stories and make your mama and your grandmama tell you while you still can and treasure that and write that down. So if you could speak on maybe a, a way that any of us can, can start those open-ended questions because sometimes our grandmamas and our great-grandmamas did not think it was anything special because it's what they did. Mm -hmm. Like I said, their hands were always busy. You know, if you weren't shelling peas, you were fixing something yep. you're always fixing something always um so, so let's talk about how we how we force those stories <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question and i relate to that that one can't sit still ever she never sits still i'm, I'm calling her out because it's fun and i don't get to talk often we don't attend things together often because of COVID now so i'm just gonna tease them but yeah to answer your question um i think it is almost making it seem as a sort of passive question. Like, so I remember when I would be at my great grandmother's house and we'd just be talking about things and I would look for sort of an entry point, right? So if I felt like there was something that was leading me down a pathway or answering a question that I was already curious about, I would just open it up there. And in some ways too, I felt like they were a little private as well. So if I seemed like I was a little too inquisitive, then she might clam up. But if I just sort of let it progress, then it happens that way. And um, that happened that way and, and we were able to have that conversation. And a lot of great stories came from that. In hindsight, I wish I would have just like had my phone and been recording it. But what I actually did, my grandmother and I, was that like two years ago? Um, my maternal side of the family is rooted in West Baton Rouge. And so one day I was like, I have some questions, let's take a ride. And so I got my camera and I got a recorder and as we were going along, like we just drove in a huge circle and she was like, okay, this is where this thing was. This is where that thing was. And we, I'm like, okay, now stop. Now I'm getting out and taking pictures um, and writing things down. And so that was a more sort of formal um, way to do that. And she was a trooper. She enjoys that kind of stuff. And we, we hang out a lot. So that works. So if you have somebody who's active and, and mobile and they can do that, just get in the car one day and ask some questions and like take pictures with your phone and label it. Um, and just and go from there. Even if you have um, images and, and pictures, oftentimes in old photo albums, the adhesive and things kind of eat away and corrode and, and mess with the, the image quality. So if you have the ability to scan those things, scan it and just sit down and literally just go sit and go down, okay, who was this? What's their name? Do you know when they were born? 
um, and just try your best to, to fill that in. And even if they're like, well, why are you asking me? Because I want to know. And I don't know too many grandparents that are going to be like, no, get away from me, grandchild. I don't want to spend time with you. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to want to spend time with you. They enjoy that. I enjoy it. So, um, so yeah, while you have folks, just find where those entry points might be and then um, just let it happen naturally. Or if you have the ability to plan ahead, plan ahead and just make a day out of it. Well, you mentioned that people are kind of staying put because of COVID. Mm -hmm. I know because of COVID, I'm actually seeing my relatives in other states. Every Sunday we have mm. happy hour and we are asking those, we are, we are taking the intentional step to say, remember that, remember that, what was that all about and who was that person? And tell me about the man who ran the, the liquor up and down yep. the hollers in West Virginia. Um, let's write it down because w since we are talking, you gotta have something to talk about. So we're asking those family questions on Zoom. <laughs> so, um, and, and it will be something that my grandchild will have now. Right. Because we think we're gonna remember, but we don't necessarily and we don't share mm -hmm. so um i i i honor you for capturing <laughs> capturing you and i love the idea of just driving around and having that as a conversation starter does anyone else have a question or comment for dr Plummer? oh yes yeah, there's something online how did heirloom pieces Oh, with our wonderful Ronlin. How did heirloom pieces such as clothing, tablecloths, or quilts inspire the artists that you interviewed mm -hmm. or, or possibly get repurposed in their own work? Oh, that's a cool question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think about Miss Carolyn specifically. She was a fourth generation quilter. And so she was saying that oftentimes um, when things might have gotten a little tattered, even as a small girl, when things got tattered or super worn and couldn't be mended anymore, they just got cut up and that was what they could use to play with in terms of like learning how to sew and doing things on the machine. Um, same thing with Karen, she was telling me how and she was coming up um, and she couldn't fit certain clothes anymore or perhaps her parents may have had um, curtains or other things like that. She would like make her own vests and make her own outfits uh, and make things for her dolls. So. Absolutely, those sorts of things, you know, before we started talking about thrifting and thrifting became a thing or, um, you know, like upcycling, that was just the nature of life. Like, okay, well, these things don't serve the purpose they were originally um, intended for anymore, so what can we do with this? And so in some ways, that was, again, this early introduction to like art making, like here, you have these materials, what are you gonna do with it? Um, that was everything, like you said, from curtains to tablecloths, co old clothing, um, old discarded scraps that maybe something was already made, but there were a few scraps left that were a little too small or like misshapen to do anything else with. Um, now we're making our masks out of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for your work. That was awesome. It was really great. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about scraps. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother's a seamstress and I grew up in her sewing room, watching her sew almost every single day um and uh, scraps i had so much fun with scraps when i was a kid that's it, literally how i learned to sew using her scraps and incorporating them into my clothes um i always had you know cute little outfits because i would add things to it you know um i was lucky enough to have an older cousin that had a great fashion sense so i got all of her hand-me-downs <laughs> and i was always smaller than her right so i would have to make those things fit me and i would get in trouble for getting on my grandmother's sewing machine <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I knew what to do, yeah. you know, in theory, because I'm always watching her. Um, and she didn't, never wanted me to, to mess up her settings, you oh, know what oh, I mean? Yeah. But, yes, yeah. she never wanted me to mess up her settings, but it does inform my work today. I realized, like, honestly, just sitting here listening to your presentation, how I create, and it's literally from scraps. It's from found things. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I say, like, hmm, what can I do today? If I'm having a stressful day, if I'm, you know, feeling out of sorts or some kind of way, I think, you know, maybe I should make something today. And I go around my house and I find things that I can use to construct something. And I don't know, that was just, I, that was really awesome. I really appreciate your work, it was great. Thanks. And that's the hope, right? That we just sit and think and it's like, wait a minute. I hadn't even realized like how, how all these things inform one another. And to me, that's what 
really is going to help to continue making those shifts in like art education and art history. Like everything doesn't have to be like birthed from, you know, Greek or European mythology or all these other things, but everyday life. Like everybody doesn't go to school and like study art and sit in the studio all day. Some people are like self-taught and they just learn from home and those things are just as valid and just as important. So I'm glad you made that connection. Do you think that with, now that we have things like this where we can capture the photos and the oral history and you have things like Pinterest and you have Instagram and even TikTok, that ways to share, to, ways to brag, ways to um, uh, see some ideas and get that creative spark. Do you think that's going to make a crazy change or bring us to the next level? Absolutely. Fun fact, Loy, so let me go back really quickly. Da, 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 da. Loy, on right. I met Loy through Instagram. Okay. So we were, so you know, you can like do a deep dive and look at hashtags and everything. And so I'm just like scrolling through black women fiber artists. Like I want to know who's making what. And I feel like these outlets connect us to one another in ways that we just simply hadn't been previously um, before technology, internet, et cetera, you sort of knew who was in your general vicinity. And if you had access to sort of gain information outside of that, then great. But now, um, like I love, we are, one of my favorite things to say is like, I'm a member of YouTube University. Like okay. how I learn sure. things, if I don't know something, I was trying to figure out like a particular kind of stitch and I was like, I don't know, what, how do I do this? Even with mask making, like when pandemic started and you couldn't find anything anywhere, I was like, okay, how do people make these two panel masks? I got on YouTube yeah. and that's how I learned. So I think um, it absolutely opens up um, innumerable possibilities for people to either present their work, to learn techniques, um, to get access in ways that aren't um, too financially taxing. Um, and it just allows artists to also sort of take control of their narratives and stories because they can often be at the forefront of their own accounts and sites and things like that. Um, and they can present their work in the way that they want to. So Dr. Plummer, we have another comment on Facebook. Your work is really inspiring. Oh. Now you have me cautiously thinking about the quality and legacy of materials that I'll be leaving behind mm -hmm. and what story those materials will tell. Oh, I've got shivers, yes. That makes me <laughs> so happy. Like I think about, um, my mom and I joke about this all the time where she was like, what did mommy say? Like, you don't buy cheap shoes and all these other things, but it's so true. Like I, wa I was trying to debate what to wear. It was too cool for me to wear what I wanted to, but like I still have one of her skirts and it's like perfectly constructed. And so even that informs like what I invest in, the kinds of things that I purchase. Like I don't want them to fall apart tomorrow. I'm, I need something to leave behind. Um, and I still have some of those things, coats, all this other stuff. But yeah, it really makes you think about like, oh, I need to take care of my things. Like, you know, what is this made out of? How do I take care of this? How do I mend it? Or what do I want to add to it to make it my own? So thank you for that, yeah. Yes, excellent. Any other questions? And I see, um, I see some lovely face masks in the audience there <laughs> um, that's, that was probably made locally. Any other questions for Dr. Plummer or comments? Or do we have any other quilters or other textile artists in the room? Because you, you're making something. What, what kind of textiles? Well, I mostly work with Jean, um, and I actually just started um, felting. Oh, so, yeah. like, I'm oh, obsessed cool. with felting. Like, it's so much fun. Yeah. I love it. And again, um, library has books, magazines. We have the Creative Bug digital database. And then there's the whole Pinterest rabbit hole that you can go down and never come out. Ever. So in the old days, you know, grandmother's hands were always busy. Today, our hands are always on this thing. <laughs> so, so we have to be conscious and intentional about where we spend our time. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's exciting. I know um, after the flood, here, and, and in the COVID pandemic, you, you get mentally depressed. And so you start looking for sparks. Mm -hmm. And so you stay in that Pinterest rabbit hole for a very long time. But sooner or later, you have to come out and start doing something. So I love the idea of blue jeans as, as a, I mean, because it's everywhere, you know, and it, and it speaks to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really cool. So can we come up and look at what you've brought? Yeah, so this is, these are a few of the panels that were part of the work that I created as part of my dissertation. Um, and then I even brought a few books that 
I just either love or help to sort of inform my research that are related to fiber and textiles of some sort or black women's artistry. So feel free. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing. We thought this would be a lovely tangent to the yellow house. Mm -hmm. um, I did wear yellow. Um, <laughs> And have at least one handmade item on. Um, we have copies of the book upstairs. If you have not yet read it, we have it online. If you have not yet read it, and now it can be told, May fifteenth, Sarah Broom, right here outside, awesome. unless the weather is bad, in which case she'll be inside. Um, if it's inside, it's seventy-five people only, unless things change for the better. And if it's outside, we have plenty more room. So May 15th, Sarah Broom, we do have on the Yellow House Info Guide, which you can easily get to through readonebook.org, or you go to the library's website, ebrpl.com, the Info Guide lists events such as this one. You can go back and re-watch the event because it'll be archived on YouTube, right, Josh, and Facebook? And some other events are already online and archived and f other things are coming. For example, Dr. Robin Merrick will be joining us in April, this heart not far, far away, to do a, a discussion. We have some virtual discussions and our discussions are not lectures, okay? They're just com casual. Um, we have other programs here and there and, and we just love the idea of, to me, the Yellow House, eloquent, um, it, there's so much creative <laughs> spark in every member of the, that family. Uh, and to keep the family straight, uh, our, our adult programming group uh, and uh, genealogy have prepared a genealogy family tree. Oh, nice. So that you get the, the, all the, when you have 11 brothers and sisters, you got to kind of keep them straight. And as, the, um, as Sarah says, the house was the 13th child. So it's there on the family tree as well. So thank you so much. I'm going to come up and look because I'm just like a quilting lover. I don't do it, but I sure love it. And I would love to see what you have. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is great.